everyone and welcome to this episode of Days Out. Today we've come all the way to Lincolnshire, also known as Bomber County, to have a look around the Lincolnshire Aviation Museum here at East Kirkby. RAF East Kirkby was commissioned in August 1943 and was the home of 57 and 630 Squadron. It was also the headquarters of the 5th Bomber Group, with satellite bases at Hemswell, Manby, Spilsby and Strumby. The base's final raid took place in April 1945, after which 630 Squadron was disbanded whilst the 57th became part of the Tiger Force. It was then used by the USAF Air Rescue until 1958. Sold in 1964, the base became a chicken farm until being acquired by Fred and Harold Patton who lost their brother Christopher during a raid on Nuremberg. Opened in 1988, the museum is run as a memorial to Bomber Command. Over the years, the museum has built up the largest private collection of wartime photographs. Also on display is equipment used by each crew member, including the ground crew. The pride of the museum is, of course, the Admiral Lancaster, the largest bomber to be used by the RAF during the Second World War. Now the Lancaster is actually a development of an earlier aircraft, the Avro Manchester, and in fact during trials the Lancaster was often referred to as the Manchester Mark III. The majority of them were powered by 1,640 horsepower Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, except for the Mark II which had 1,650 horsepower Bristol Hercules radial engines. Last used by Coastal Command in 1956, the design was later developed into the Avro Lincoln, the Avro Shackleton, which was used for aircraft early warning, and two transporter aircraft, the York and the Lancastrian. Now one feature of the Lancaster that the aircraft inherited from its earlier sibling, the Manchester, was the massive bomb bay, because one requirement of the Manchester was it had to carry an 18-inch torpedo. And to give you an idea of the size of this, the empty weight of a Lancaster is 37,000 pounds with a loaded weight of 65,000 pounds. Having such a large bomb bay, the Lancaster was the obvious choice for carrying the RAF's heaviest bombs, including this example, known as a cookie, which weighs 4,000 pounds. Believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, there is a larger version of this weighing 8,000 pounds. Now the way it works is basically there are a series of detonators inside at various stages leading to a central detonator inside the bomb. The most famous raid using Lancasters occurred on the 16th and 17th of May 1943 against the dams of the Ruhr using the 12,000 pound upkeep. Designed by Barnes Wallace, the bomb was skimmed across the reservoir surface, clearing anti torpedo nets from a range of 400 yards at a height of 60 feet. It would then sink before being detonated by a pressure charge, which is why, despite being called a bomb, it is actually classified by the RAF as a mine. Another of Barnes Wallace's creations is this the Tall Boy, which also weighs 12,000 pounds. Known as a deep penetrating mine, its most famous use was against the Tirpit when she was stationed in Norway. Later, Barnes Wallace would create a even larger bomb than this, the Grand Slam, which weighs 22,000 pounds, of which 41 were dropped, all of which came in 1945. 
One of the last uses of the Lancaster by the RAF was during Operation Manor in April and May 1945. This consisted of dropping food parcels in the Netherlands and the museum has a very rare collection of artefacts from this operation. The USAAF also carried out a similar operation named Chowhand, whilst there was also a land-based campaign known as Faust. The museum's example, Just Jane, is a Mark 7. The features of the Mark 7 being the .5 machine guns and the slightly relocated Martin dorsal turret. 230 of these aircraft were built at the Austin Works near Longbridge and were intended for the Tiger Force out in the Far East, but following the dropping of the atomic bombs, this never materialised. Instead, the aircraft served with the French Aero Naval before going to Canada for air-sea rescue operations. Returning to Britain, she went to RAF Scampton, just down the road, where she became a gate guard, coming to the museum in 1987 and has been restored into taxiing condition. Another aircraft here in the hangar is the equally famous de Havilland Mosquito. This aircraft, entirely made out of wood, first flew in November 1940, but didn't see service with Bomber Command until 1941. Under Bomber Command, these aircraft were used as pathfinders, laying target markers, which was particularly useful as the RAF were flying at night, whereas the Americans were flying in the daytime. The aircraft, though, does have two famous raids to its name. The first was an attack on the Gestapo headquarters in Oslo in September 1942, and the second took place in February 1944 on the Amiens prison in France, which helped to liberate a group of resistance fighters which were due to be assassinated the following morning. The museum's example is a night fighter Mark 11 and has been restored using various components from other mosquitoes recovered from crash sites, warehouses and airfields across the world. The cockpit came from Hotel Juliet 711 used by 619 Squadron at Little Snoring, claiming the squadron's first victory in January 1944. Like the Lancaster, this mosquito has been restored into taxiing condition. At the front of the hangar is a Taylor Croft Oster. The Oster was based on the Model A, introduced in the USA in 1938, and built from a composite of wood and metal with a canvas wing. Powered by a 130 horsepower Lycoming engine, it was first used for reconnaissance in August 1942, with 1,600 being constructed. Whilst undergoing restoration is a Percival Proctor. Issued in 1941 as a radio and communication trainer, 1,143 were built across nine variants and lasted in RAF service until 1955. This example is a Mark IV, with four seats, of which 258 were built. Also inside the hangar is the Lincolnshire Aircraft Recovery Group. Formed in 1973, the group has recovered a variety of aircraft, both Allied and Axis, from across the county. Other exhibits include a 60cm German searchlight and a 40mm Bofors anti-aircraft gun. Other restored buildings on the site include a billet hut, where air crews would have slept and relaxed. Next door is the briefing room. The map shows the course taken for a raid on Berlin, with additional information about the weather and anti-aircraft emplacements. The hub of all airbases is, of course, the control tower. Built to a standard design, the tower includes an open balcony for officers to observe aircraft taking off and returning. Communication is vital in any operation, and during the Second World War, much of this work was carried out by the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, as illustrated in this display. To give visitors a better understanding of this, the museum has a collection of radio equipment used by both air crews and ground staff. There is also a collection of turrets, mainly of the dorsal type, 
including examples from Bolton Paul, Martin and Fraser Nash. Before the arrival of the four-engined Lancaster and Halifax, Bomber Command used a whole host of two-engined aircraft, such as the Manchester mentioned earlier. These are portrayed in the early Bombers exhibition, with the wing section on the left belonging to a Vickers Wellington. Now this is another of the museum's long-term projects. It's a Hadley Page Hampton. The Hampton first flew in 1936, although it didn't enter service until 1938. Under Bomber Command, it took part in some of the earliest raids over Germany and was highly regarded because of its all-round protection and its payload, which was equal to the Vickers Wellington. It continued in service under Coastal Command as a torpedo bomber until 1943, but by then it had been replaced by more powerful aircraft like the Mosquito that we saw earlier. This particular example, Alpha Echo 436, was recovered from Sweden in 1976 and has been under restoration since 1989. Throughout the war, many airmen attempted daring escapes from POW camps across Europe. This is illustrated in the Escape Museum, created by the RAF Escape Society, telling the stories of both airmen and the resistance who would help them. The Home Front exhibition tells the story of the Second World War in the UK and includes displays about civilian life, the Royal Observer Corps, the Home Guard and even the Land Army. It's not just aircraft here at East Kirkby. The museum also has a fine selection of vehicles such as this Bedford O Series lorry. Introduced in 1939, the O Series had a 72 horsepower, six cylinder engine and came in many variants, this example being the OXC with a trailer which was a joint project with Scammell. Now to give you an idea of just how big this trailer is, many many years ago I actually built the airfix model of this and in the back of it I managed to get the fuselage of a Spitfire and the two wings mounted either side and it fitted very snugly. It's also quite interesting because after the war, many of these vehicles, along with examples from AEC and other manufacturers, were sold off into private hands because the various forces around the world, and in Britain, didn't need them anymore. So this led to a surge in commercial enterprises, with many people buying them up, starting their own businesses, which is why in this day and age we see many hauliers across our roads in Britain. This is a Fordson WOT-1 crew bus. Powered by an 85 horsepower engine, the vehicle is built on a 6x4 chassis and is the only example of its kind to survive. Other vehicles in the collection include a David Brown tractor, a Fordson Jeep, an AEC Matador fuel bowser, a 1931 Bedford bus and a Ford 8. Let us not forget though that Bomber Command made a huge sacrifice during the Second World War with 55,500 killed, around 44% of its overall total with 848 lost from East Kirkby. So the museum has erected a chapel as a place of reflection and remembrance. And so that concludes our visit here to the Lincolnshire Aviation Museum at East Kirkby. I hope you guys have enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, subscribe and leave a comment and I hope you can join me on my next day out. Goodbye for now.